4.8 piecewise functions. Um, so the first part of this chapter, the first bulk that we did for the situation and all that, we did um, some fairly straightforward, even though then the math maybe at times is a little weird with exponential and quadratic, a lot of those questions made sense. Then yesterday we saw these step functions, and it was a little bizarre because we had these steps that were going up and going down, and it was kind of a weird pattern. Um, this one's also a bizarre one. There isn't necessarily going to be a steady pattern for the entire thing. When you look at the word piecewise, you can see the word piece in it, and a piece means a part. So what a piecewise function is, is a whole bunch of different functions, different parts of functions, mashed together. Piecewise function. made up of parts of different functions. <coughs> so what that means is we've learned or we, we learned constant functions, which is the flat horizontal line. We learned linear functions, that was number two, which is the diagonal line going up or diagonal line going down. We then looked at quadratic, which was the parabola or the parabola. My advanced students were coming to me and saying, sir, what's a parabola? I said, that's still out. A parabola, <laughs> which is a parabola. Then we looked at exponential, which was the one that it started out really slow and then all of a sudden snapped. It was the, kind of the, uh, the zombie apocalypse type of idea. Um, and then we paused and then we looked at step functions, which was the steps going up, going down, or in combination. So piecewise is take a part of the linear one, take a part of the exponential, take a part of the constant, mash it all together, and you get this piecewise function. Yesterday, when we did step functions, we only really cared about the graph. Even though we talked about the table, we only really cared about the graph. We didn't even look at the rule. I didn't even put a rule on the board. For us, for piecewise, the rule is actually the main focus along with the graph. But let's look at the table as well. So we'll do what we did before. Let's look at the table. Graph and rule. So we'll look at the table graph and rule for a piecewise function so we can try to figure out if there is a pattern, if there isn't, what it looks like, what the rule's going to end up looking like. That's why we have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And I'll do this uh, 3, 3, Three, four, five. Okay. The table is not our focus, but it still could be a useful tool for some of us, depending on how you approach things. Our real focus is going to be on the graph and the rule. We'll spend more time on this. So let's quickly look at the table at least and just maybe talk about what we see. What do you notice about the table? Anything? Tom? It's like, it's like constant and then like starts increasing. Yeah. This first section here is all constant. <coughs> it's the same number every single time. And then after that, it starts going up. It starts increasing, which is linear. Because it's going up by the same number every single time. That's what a piecewise function is. A piecewise function is parts of different functions. So here, you have part of a constant function mixed in with a linear function afterwards. So our table is going to show multiple patterns, which is not really going to be helpful all that much. You're going to notice something is going to happen, and then all of a sudden it's going to change. And maybe it could change again, it could change again. It could change an infinite number of times. Typically, we see maybe two or three, but we notice that there's something different here. So we notice that there's a change in the pattern. Let's make a little of that change in the pattern. So that's not our focus, but at least there it is. Let's really focus on the graph and the rule. So if I just give you an example of what this thing looks like, there's negative two, there's negative one, negative two, positive one, positive two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> 
So this table, even if we just put dots on the table, we've got negative two and three, which is right here. Which I'm fairly happy with that. The next one is negative one and three is right there. And the next one is zero and three is right there. My next dot is one and four, which is right here. And then two and five, which is right here. So what we notice <coughs> for this piecewise function is that I've got a flat section followed by a section going up. And hence the different pieces, the different parts of the function. We can see this part right here, the first section, the flat line, that's the constant part. And we can see this part right here, the diagonal line, that's the linear part, which we said was going to happen based off the table. Is it always going to be constant and linear? No. It can be any combination of any of the functions that we've ever seen. Maybe it didn't have to be linear. Maybe from this point on, it was exponential and it went like a curve afterwards. Maybe it was a parabola on one half and parabola something else on the other half. So really, this is just one example where in this case you have a constant and linear. So what we notice with the graph is we have again these different pieces put together. Going to go back. Different Again, hence the word piecewise. Now the graph, once you have it, is really not, not really the problem. You can all read that graph. The rule is going to be the messy part. Maybe you want to wait till because I'm going to write something here, and then I'll put it on the board there as well. Okay, so here is what I'll write for this one. <laughs> that didn't take very long. Is that the rule? Uh huh. Okay. I don't like it. <laughs> so that doesn't look like a rule. You don't you know sure this is like that? Because one got me. Okay. Write that down first. Can we do wine. So write that down first. I'm trying to show it to you in the worst way first. That commas. So f of x equals, this is a big curly bracket. Mr. Uh, if you're in the SAD, these are the chicken ones. They're called brace brackets. They're called brace brackets. <laughs> Don't go off to the, your university or college or whatever to talk about chicken this bracket. Uh, there's a three here, there's an x plus three. These are commas. <coughs> Then you have this mess over here, which we'll decipher in a second. That says negative 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 0. Whatever that means, we'll get back to that. It says 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 2. I told myself I was going to write over here, and I said, Chris, can you see this? Perfect, thank you. Our focus is going to be the graph and the rule. The graph, no problem, because if the graph's given to you, we can all read that graph, and we can see that there's different sections of the graph. The rule is a bit more cumbersome because there's a lot of extra stuff here that we're not necessarily used to. And also, I think Max said it as soon as I wrote that. So can we just write a y instead? Okay, so let's make this look easier for us. This is one common way of writing it on exam questions. Multiple choice, short answer, long answer. So how else could we write it? Max said. Or let's just write it with a y first off yeah. instead of the f of x. Which means if you see f of x and you're having a tough time with it, cross it out, write it out. Put a Y there. It'll be easier for everybody. The first part, there's not really a lot else we can do. It's still going to be this. Now, instead of thinking about this, what you could do, and my apologies for doing this to you right now, but I could change it and just say Y is equal to and Y is equal to instead of writing the big graph. That'll be your call. If you want to change it to that, you can. But you'll never see this. You'll always see this brace bracket, the chicken lips. You will never see the double rule written like that. The comma is irrelevant. I'm just going to leave a space here and a space. Then you have this thing. We have not dealt with inequalities this year. We did last year in grade 9 a little bit. Right? The less than symbol, the greater than symbols, and all that. The, uh, you know, I don't know, the, how did you guys learn it? The crocodile mouths and the Ducks or whatever they are. Um, crocodile mouth is what you I think you learned. This is less than this, or this is even that, or whatever. 
So let's turn this into what we normally see. We normally see interval notation with square brackets. Let's turn this into square brackets. How would you write this with square brackets? We see the notation of epsilon. Any suggestions? If something is equal to, if something is equal to facing in, facing out. Facing in. Facing in. So I'm going to leave the space. I don't even have to write the column. I'll leave the space. Bracket facing in with a negative 2. Take a guess as to what the other number here is going to be. Facing in, facing out. Out. In. In. That's safe. Because it says equal to. You see the equal to is facing in. If you don't see the word, if you don't see equal to, it's facing out. Here, take a stab as to what the next one would be. If you just look at how we've turned this into this, what would this end up being? Facing in. Facing in. Zero. zero. Facing in. Facing in two. There's no line beneath it. Would be facing. Yeah, and we'll we'll see that in our examples. And we have a work class on this tomorrow, so we'll see more variations. So you'll see a lot of questions written like this. If you want to turn it into this form, then that's fine too. Which means you may need to be comfortable with this. Now this makes sense to us. We know what this means. This means everything between negative two to zero. Negative one, all the decimals, all those numbers. This might be a little trickier for you to figure out, but it's the same thing. Either or is okay. So table graph and rule, our focus is the graph and the rule, so let's focus on the graph and the rule and do some more examples. Let's see how we can move this. So I'm going to focus on those intervals just to see if we can convert. <coughs> First one, I'll write uh, zero. That second one, I'll write. All right, like this. A more on that side. So what I'd like you to do is just take this, which is notation that we're not normally used to this year in equality. It used to be a bigger part of this course, but as of last year, they took it out. So we're not really used to this, even though it's fine, and some of you are completely comfortable with it. Let's convert it into the other form, into the square bracket form. We'll start off with a couple of easier ones, and then we'll step it up. <coughs> How your brackets face in and out is important. Where your numbers are is also important. So if we take this one, and forget about the brackets just for a second, just worry about the numbers. I think we can see that when we take this one, we're going to have a 0 and a 7 like that. I think that's pretty obvious. If you're wondering, how do you know that the 0 comes first and the 7 comes first? The smaller number always comes first. For the 0, look at your symbol. This says less than. 0 is less than. If it's 0 is less than, it doesn't say equal to. If it doesn't say equal to, you're not going to actually include it. So we need to have an exclusion bracket on the 0. Facing out. The 7, facing in, facing out. Facing out. If you do not see the equal sign, it's facing out. If you see the equal sign, it's facing in. Can you write that? Yep. So this is turning into this. And that's probably something that we're more comfortable with. Because we were doing domain and range and all that using this notation. We weren't doing it using this notation. We could have, but we didn't. Anyone want to take a stab at the next one? What might it be? Um, okay. Do a couple more and step it up a little. Number three will be uh, x is less than five. Number four x is greater than or equal to six. This is bizarre because now all of a sudden I can give you two numbers. Number one and two, I gave you two numbers. Starting point and ending point. No. Infinity. Oh, it's number, infinity. Yeah. Number three, I didn't give you starting and ending points. I just gave you one of them. So if I only give you one of them, the other one goes on forever. I think that's a negative and positive. Good question. So look at your symbol and what does this mean? This means x is less than five. You know what? I'll write it in words just to make sure. X is less than five. So think of all the numbers that are less than five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. How far do you go then? Negative infinity. That's why you know it's a negative infinity for this one. 
Okay, so now if you know there's a negative infinity, what would the interval look like? Why negative infinity first, not the phi first? Oh, it's smaller. Negative infinity comes first, and then phi comes second, facing out from the phi. So with, go ahead. The smaller number always comes first. Okay. Always first, the smaller number always comes first. <coughs> so with that in mind, think about what the next one would be. In words, by the way, this is x is greater slash equal to 6. Just to make sure you're not reversing your symbols, because maybe you're thinking that that means less than the path is greater than. Perfect. 6, including x equal Including, including because we see the equal side, so including positive. Okay, so with that out of the way, just to make sure that we were comfortable with the conversion. Yep. Okay. Why is it, why is it So think of all the numbers that are bigger than 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Bung boy, forever. Positive infinity. Uh, so between 6 and positive infinity, which one's the smaller number? 6 is the smaller one. The smaller one always comes first. The bigger number always comes second. So now we talk about converting. Let's get back to the piecewise. Focus on the rule and using the rule. So consider, I'll give you this rule, y is equal to two x minus three, so let's say x squared, and I'll tell you here it's going to be from uh, zero five like this, and this one's going to be five to eight like this. And I'll ask you some questions here. So this is generally what we're going to end up doing with piecewise functions. The step functions really were focused on the graphs. For piecewise, our focus predominantly is going to be on the rules and working with the rules and just trying to figure out how do we actually do this. So the first question, well, they're all asking for a lie. So the first one, what is y when x is 2? Now, when we go back up to the rule here, there's really two rules here. There's the first rule, which is linear. It would be nice if we knew that, but even if you don't, it's linear. The next one, remember what that one is? Quadratic. That's squared. Okay, so this one's linear and this one's quadratic. Again, it could be any combination of any pieces or parts of function. What is y when x is 2? Well, to figure that out, we have to replace the 2 into a rule. The problem is we have two rules. Which one do you put it? Why the top one? So these things right here, this interval over here, represents the x things. So these things right here are the x. <coughs> so if you're told that x is 2, Ask yourself, okay, x is 2. Where does 2 fit? Does 2 fit in the interval between 0 and 5, or does 2 fit in the interval between 5 and 8? Well, 2 is clearly between 0 and 5, so it fits in there. If it fits in there, we're going to use the first rule. I'm saying use first rule, but you don't have to have the same first rule. So let's go ahead and use the first rule. The first rule is y is equal to 2x minus 3. We're choosing the first rule because that's where this 2 fits in. It fits into the first rule. So let's put the 2 in for the x and calculate. We have 2 times 2 minus 3. Punch all that in, do it in your head. 
times 2 is 4 minus 3 is 1. So the answer for question 8, what's the y when x is 2 is 1. We chose the first rule because that's where your x fit in. B, same idea, same process. What's the y when x is 5? Where does 5 fit in? The first rule or the second rule? But it appears in the first rule. And it appears in the second rule. It's in both. But it's excluding. You don't pick one, you choose the one that actually makes more sense. This one's excluding, which means it doesn't actually get to 5. 5 is not really there. It gets really, really close, 4.99999. But it doesn't actually get to 5. It gets to 5 right there. Including means it actually is 5. So we're going to use the second rule for this one. So for this one, let's use the second rule. You don't have to write second rule, I am, just so we know. <coughs> and the second rule is y equals x squared. Let's replace the x with the number that we're trying to uh, that we're replacing with, which is the 5. So it'd be y is equal to 5 squared. Sorry, did I even get 25? <coughs> y is equal to 25. I'll give you a minute to see if you haven't done it. The question will just become, which rule do you choose? And we'll do our last example after this. X is 7, first rule, second rule. Mm -hmm. Second rule, 7 fits into the second interval, so we choose the second rule. Second rule y is equal to x squared, so let's put the 7 into the x squared, and we get 49. Questions before we spice this up a little more? Wait, you guys might have enough. Yeah. It's too spicy. I'm Pakistani, I can handle more spice. Oh. That's a good one. Okay. Sorry, was there a question? Mary, did you have a question? Did someone have a question? <laughs> it's so much confusing. It just like doesn't work with my brain. You're very sick as well right now. So. Thank you. I'm glad you're taking that into consideration. So let's do one. Okay, <laughs> consider f of x is equal to uh, 0, sorry, 10 times 1.2 exponent x, and this one will be 600. This is going to be 4, and this one will be 600. That's why we're doing this. That's we're spicing it up. You don't have to be Pakistani like spicy things. Okay, so we've changed stuff in a couple ways. First off, the rules look a little worse, and I've decided to use that notation instead of the square bracket notation that we're more used to. So here are the we have just two questions. Uh, x equals four plus y and b will be x equals two. So when I first started the lesson, when I was talking about the table graph and rule, under the rule, I wrote down two versions of it. The top one, and then I said, give you the, the bottom one, so the different, easier words in the workbook. So for, us, for some of us, you may look at this rule, and you may be completely comfortable with it. You already know what you're doing. Great. I'd say it's probably about a half and a half split. Half of us are going to be completely okay with what I wrote on the board. The other half might need to convert this. Might need to just make this look like something a little bit easier for us. Okay, so the x is going to be in the center of the equation, 
Yes? How do you include it, though? Like, doesn't it always have to be? So let's write this differently. Let's take this entire rule and write it differently first. And we'll see what that is going to be different. Instead of writing f of x, I'm going to write a y. Instead of putting that, uh, that curly bracket for chicken lips, I'm going to just going to write two rows. The first rule is y is equal to 10 times 1.2 exponent x. The second rule is y is equal to 600. So I basically have two rules that I'm just going to rip apart and write it like this instead. You don't have to do this. This is just if you're looking at this and this, you know, makes your heart beat a little bit faster, then let's do this instead. Then we have to convert these guys, which we just did earlier. We have a 0 to 4, including the 0, excluding the 4. The other one, this is the one Philip was getting at. Did you say positive infinity, negative infinity? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, Positive. So x is bigger than or equal to 4, which means all the numbers that are bigger than 4, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so on and so on. So it goes on forever. That forever is a positive infinity. So what comes first? Not the positive infinity, the smaller number. The smaller number is 4. And then it goes all the way up to positive infinity. Including the 4, because it's an inclusion. And if you're wondering, do you include or exclude the infinity? Exclude. Exclude. This was the my wonderful drawing of the carrot with the horse. Uh, okay. So let's work with this then. If Hopefully, for a lot of us, this is probably easier to look at than that is, and this makes a little bit more sense. So for the first question, A, when x is 4, what's y? Which rule do we use? Bottom one. Because that's A plus 4. Uh, how am I supposed to use the bottom rule? Perfect. It's constant. There's no x to replace. I'm a beast. It's 600. That's what I would say. It's a beast. Normally, we would take the 4, put it into the rule, and replace it. But there's no to replace it because it's constant. It's 600 the entire time. Next rule, x equals 2. First rule, because 2 is between 0 and 4. So let's use the first rule. I'm going to use the first rule. And instead of actually writing the rule, let's just do the calculation for it. We put an x value of 2 in because that's what we're being told. 14.4. There we go. What if I'm broken into If both rules work, it's a rare scenario. But you, if both rules work, you'd end up in the same number with both rules. So you want to do like elimination? It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. But in case it does, as a mistake, maybe, even then, you should get the same number of both ways. Also, like, they pretty much can't be both. You should be choosing one, not both. So, like, you don't use one, you have to choose one? Yeah. Yeah, you should always be making a choice as to which one. Hey, right? Would there be, like, a situation where you have, let's say, like, both rules? Yeah. Would you use, like, elimination? No. no. Yeah, at no point should we be doing elimination. Like, you notice how these are double stacked and you would subtract them and all that? No, 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 no. Completely separate chapter. Okay. Mind to hitting stop?